So we're going to look at some basic tips and tricks for getting around the femoral canal and the inguinal canal. We'll commence with the femoral canal and its various landmarks. We place the transducer just below the groin crease to find femoral artery and vein. Sweeping from lateral to medial, you can make out the pubic ramus in behind and the pectineus muscle, which forms the floor of the femoral canal. Most importantly, find the pubic tubercle. Then medial to the vein, which is going to expand on strain, this is the femoral canal. So invariably there's some fat there, some lymph nodes, and this is all occurring beneath the, the level of the pubic tubercle and the inguinal ligament, which spans more superficial and anterior to the femoral canal. So if we oblique to point from pubic tubercle to ASIS, we see the inguinal ligament overlying the femoral canal. So we need to make sure we're not observing superficial to the inguinal ligament because that would be the inguinal canal. So watching this area medial to the femoral vein and anterior to the pectineus, we would firstly make sure that we've identified the SFJ, saphenofemoral junction, and move down towards it because if we're too high, it can look like everyone has a hernia. So if we're at the level of the inguinal ligament, we're too high. So we're asking the patient now to distend the abdomen, to balloon, to valsalve, and we're looking for movement medial to the vein. In longitudinal, we find the femoral artery move medially to find the common femoral vein, and then oblique the lower end of the transducer to identify the SFJ. The pectineus is seen behind, sort of triangular muscle, this anterior margin of that pectineus uh, is where we look for our femoral canal. So obviously we don't want too much of the vein in the picture, but inguinal ligament there is the landmark below which any movement is significant. So down to the level of the SFJ, if something travels that far, it means it's moved two to three centimeters below the pelvic rim. Therefore, there is a hernial defect or orifice. So the patient's now straining. We can see movement at the level of the pelvic rim. There's a little bulge as the peritoneum sags down, but it's being held in by a little cribriform fascia there, um, which reinforces this point of the femoral canal. So we expect to see some movement at the level of the pelvic rim, but not down to this level, which would indicate significance, um, particularly if you use uh, the inguinal ligament there as your landmark. If it's moving south towards the SFJ, so not at this level, then it's significant. So back into transverse, we could take our imaging series like this, find the SFJ, move immediately superior, take a dual image and ask the patient to strain and make sure you're imaging medial to the vein there. At times, a large femoral hernia can compress the femoral vein or cause it to obliterate, but this is not necessarily reliable criteria. So this is the only canal of the body that I'd say a cough could be useful. For inguinal canal now, we're only going to be using a valsalva or abdominal distension. So femoral canal, we want to aim three fingers below the groin crease, slide in from lateral, make sure there's lots of gel, and start looking for the pectineus muscle and this scooping bone. So this is the pubic ramus coming up towards the pubic tubercle. From here to here is pectineus, which is the floor of the femoral canal. And then you can see we're compressing the vein, which is medial to the artery. We take the pressure off, and our femoral canal is located here. And this is the point where we ask the patient to do a valsalva. So you might ask them to hold their nose, blow into their cheeks, distend the abdomen, but just make sure you don't see the hips lift up off the table. So if you can take a big breath, hold your nose, blow into your cheeks there, and you can see there's no movement in this region here, so no femoral canal hernia, and relax. Check your position. If you're just adjacent and above the SFJ, we were in a good position to diagnose one. Now, while we were performing that valsalva, we could see something move over here. So this is back at the pubic tubercle. Here's the somatic cord, immediately supralateral. So now we could look at the inguinal ligament by rotating the camera to point from the pubic tubercle 
to the ASIS, so there's the inguinal ligament. It's sometimes what the surgeons stitch the mesh to during surgery. The inguinal lig ligament's passing over the femoral vein and artery. If we're seeing the ligament, we're way too high to be assessing a femoral canal for a femoral hernia because everyone will look like they have a hernia at this level. So once we've identified that inguinal ligament, there's the spermatic cord. We could simply move above this level, sort of in sort of lawn mowing style fashion. So lots of transverse sweeps, looking for um, a bulge on strain. So at a basic level, you could look for this, ask the patient to strain, and you'd be, you know, it's a good start. You'd pick up most hernias and relax. The only difficulty with that is we can't tell from that position if it's indirect or direct because they both exit at the same point. So they both exit at the superficial ring. So when we follow the rectus abdominis down onto the pubic tubercle and move about a centimetre lateral, sorry I just got some air bubbles, about a centimetre lateral to that we fall onto the superficial ring. So we can see something's pushing out through this opening. At this stage, you don't know if it's direct or indirect. Um, but if you ask the patient to strain, more likely if it's a large defect like this one containing bowel and fat, it's more likely a direct. But when you compress it, so you ask the patient to relax, stick with it, keep watching, don't freeze the image. You follow that hernia back in and the last little bit of the compressing it back in usually shows you where the defect's located. So if the defect's located this close to a pubic tubercle here, so if it's immediately above, we're in the region of Hasselbach's triangle, which is the weakest point of the inguinal canal because the only thing holding the bowel and the fat inside our tummy is the peritoneum and a thin little layer of glad wrap called the transversalis fascia. So if the hernia looks like it's coming straight up at the camera, so just do a really gentle push and then relax again. Relax. We'll push it back in one more time. If it's coming sort of straight up at the transducer here, it's definitely a direct. And then if we want to look for an indirect hernia, we need to find the spermatic cord, which is a little bit more lateral. Nine times out of ten, poor old spermatic cord gets displaced laterally. So if you can't find it, move more lateral. And then we just find the veins, let your eye fall onto the veins and then start tracking them supralaterally. So the line that your transduce is on is from pubic tubercle to ASIS. Okay, you can't go wrong. So there's pubic tubercle, draw a line from there visually to the ASIS and then start following those veins up. The whole entire canal is only the length of your footprint of the transducer. It's only three to five centimetres. So as you follow those veins, you can see at this point, instead of travelling horizontally, they're dropping in. So that slight angulation here gives away the deep ring. And the deep ring is the entrance to the inguinal canal from this little artery, which is the inferior gap epigastric, over to here is our deep ring. And in most men, that should be below 10 millimetres. And we're only really interested in the measurement on strain. So from here to here, we're just going to watch it on strain. So a gentle push there. And all that movement is actually not occurring through the deep ring. So just relax again. So the actual deep ring is not where that hernia was coming from. It stayed put, nothing was sliding through here, so you know it's not an indirect hernia. The thing to note here is that in all normal men, the spermatic cord should slide, and the spermatic cord measures 10 mil. So the biggest pitfall is that sonographers can get a little bit excited by seeing the spermatic cord move across the screen from left to right. If it's containing these black veins and an artery, it's, it's not a hernia. Hernias must look like intra-abdominal fat, so they must look to contain something without veins. So one more push, really short, and then relax again. So watch the fat. See this fat here? It's dark grey. It doesn't have any black stripes in it. There's no veins in a hernia. Okay. So 
that's a completely normal deep ring. There's a big defect in the posterior wall of the canal, not, not too laterally, but as we move immediately above the pubic tubercle, you can see no white line, and this is a direct hernia, which is passing out the superficial ring, um, but not entering in via the deep ring, which is back up here. And that's how you look for the landmarks for hernia. And what's of interest to the surgeon is the contents, whether it reduces, and the size of the defect. And, and obviously it's possible to have a concurrent hernia, which is a hernia through the deep ring and through the posterior wall.